Welcome to From Potential to Powerhouse, success secrets from female leaders, where female trailblazers share their journeys and the aha moments that made all the difference with your host, serial entrepreneur and trailblazer herself, Tracy Holland. I'm so excited to to talk to and share the story of Kay Koplovitz. Kay is the co-founder and chairman of Springboard Growth Capital and Springboard Enterprises. But what is so incredibly inspiring, and I think what we're going to enjoy hearing about today, is her journey as founder and former chairman and CEO of USA Networks. Kay Koplovitz founded USA Networks and the Sci-Fi Channel, which today is a multi-billion dollar television cable network. And the story around how she was inspired by satellites and science and how that led her to her career is something that's so remarkable. Kay Koplovitz ran the network for 21 years before stepping down in 1998 and at that time was sold for $4.5 billion. Kay is also going to talk a little bit today about the passion she has around supporting women and the mission of her Venture Catalyst Accelerator Springboard Enterprises and really the impact she's made across the globe in women entrepreneurs and funding women businesses. So welcome, Kay, today to From Potential to Powerhouse. I'm so thrilled to have you. Well, thank you, Tracy. It's a pleasure to join you. And in 2021, as we faced probably one of the most challenging years that I can remember in 2020 with COVID, you're talking to us today from New York. Yes, I, I am here in New York City in Manhattan uh, in my apartment on Central Park West where I have been pretty much the last year. Uh, and it's really been quite a journey. Uh, I, I kind of look at it as uh, acceleration into the future uh, and that I think all of us learned uh, to put five years of learning into about five months, the way we've had to really transform our business, our lives. Uh, parents with children have had to really had to transform a lot. I mean, it's. Uh, an amazing year for all of us, but I think that what we're learning is that we're all adaptable and we must adapt uh, because it's something we actually individually can't change. Uh, we have to uh, defeat the COVID and before we can really get back to the business set in the way we used to do it, maybe we never will. I, I think there will be permanent changes actually in the year that we've been through. We have so much to jump into, so I'm really excited to talk to you about this, but Let's talk about a few of the things that describe you. I'm just going to list off some some descriptions and you you get to then tell me if you agree or not. So you've been described as a legend, a groundbreaker, a visionary, a results-oriented person, competitive, an author, a woman advocate, a job creator, a guru, a risk lover, a woman-owned company investor, a barrier breaker, an entrepreneur, a corporate CEO, and a board member. Oh, pretty good description. <laughs> I mean, that is just an incredible list. So that's me from the outside looking in. How would you describe yourself? Um, I'm very curious. I have a lot of curiosity. Um, I am very competitive, uh, but I also you know, know how to listen to people and learn. I'm a constant learner, a lifelong learner, which I think is really important. Uh, we all have to continue to learn and absorb. And I think in the world today, the speed of which is going, it's even more relevant. Um, I think I'm a game changer. I, I like to think of myself somewhat of, as a visionary. I certainly am a uh, uh, an advocate for women because uh, it's still harder for women to succeed in business and maybe even many other careers, um, whether you're in, you know, the theater or you're a conductor in an orchestra or you're an artist or anything else. I still think that uh, women do not get their fair share of the um, accolades for what they've done. And I think that we all have to learn to speak up more about people having success. And I think that's what you're doing here on your podcast is really helping women to understand how others have done it and 
actually hopefully see that they can do it too. Absolutely. And so one of the stories I loved that I heard was what you were really like from even a five-year-old little girl. So can you talk about <laughs> your relationship with your dad and what your, you remember as your first time negotiating a deal? Sure. Um, <clears throat> And when I was uh, five years old, I was in my second year of kindergarten. Back then, there wasn't a preschool. There were two years of kindergarten uh, where I grew up in a suburb of Milwaukee called Cudahy. And my dad had built a house in the next town, literally built the house himself in the next town. And he said, oh, it was about Christmas time. And in Wisconsin, you know, winters can be pretty damn cold. And uh, we had a lot of snow. Uh, and he's, and I, he said, well, we're moving. It's just before Christmas. Well, we're moving, uh, you know, this week and, you know, we're all going. And I said, well, I can't move with you, Dad. And he said, what do you mean? What do you mean you can't move with me? You're moving. We're moving. <laughs> like my dad was pretty stern. And, and I said, well, I, I just, I just can't move now because, uh, well, because why, he said. I said, because I want to graduate with my kindergarten class, Mrs. Waters' kindergarten class. And I was really determined to do that. And he was like, oh, you know, looked at me like, oh, here she goes again. Um, and, you know, he said, well, you're moving. So, you know, just get, get yourself ready because we're all moving. And I said, well, okay, Dad. I mean, if I have to move, then you'll have to raise my allowance. And he said, oh, really? What, why do I have to raise your allowance? And I said, well, it's going to cost me 50 cents a week to take the bus back to the next town to graduate so I could go to my kindergarten class. And um, my allowance was 50 cents back then, so it was doubling my allowance. I mean, it was a big ask. <laughs> and he, he looked at me and he said, I'm going to tell you something. You can, I can do that. But don't you ever ask your mother to take you or pick you up or don't ask. you you're gonna walk to the bus, you're gonna stand out there and the, no matter how cold it is, if it's 20 below zero, you're walking out there. And I said, Yeah, exactly, I will. And he said, Okay, I'll raise your allowance. And off I went and moved with them and got my allowance and took the bus to the next town to graduate with my kindergarten class. So uh I guess I was sort of made to negotiate from a very early age, really. And, but I think it, in some ways, says more about my parents, um, mm -hmm. because they wanted us to be independent, and my and they raised us to be independent, and they wanted us to make decisions. They didn't want us to make a decision that was going to hurt us, of course. But um, we can make a decision, and we have to live with it. And I think it's a good lesson. I'm not sure parents would do that today, what, what I did back in you know, the 50s, but um, you know, I, I think it really did show that they had confidence. My dad would not have let me do it if he didn't have confidence that I could handle it. It's incredible. And where were you in the birth order? How many sibs did you have? Um, I have an older sister and a younger brother. So you're the middle. Um, I'm the, yeah, I'm the neglected middle child. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> Not really. Well, but so what, were your sibs like you in this way or were you a little bit of an out, outlier? Do you remember? Uh, well, we're all different. Um, I'm my brother, my sister. My, at, at the time I'm telling this story, my brother wasn't born yet. So it was just my sister and, and me and my sister is three years older than I am. And we have very different personalities. She's, uh, uh, if my sister, when we were growing up in school, if she had to stand up in school and make a talk or speak or something, she would freeze, could not do it, couldn't. Mm. It's just has a totally different kind of personality. Um, she's more, um, very much more, I wouldn't say introverted so much as that it just frightened her um, to do that. And uh, so she communicates very, very much. But she became a teacher, actually. So she actually overcame that later on, being able to stand up in front of her class and, and teach and stuff like that. But uh, it was something, you know, she's um, very thoughtful. In terms of your entrepreneurial nature, it sounds like as well as you were pretty focused on finding ways to generate income for yourself, even in your. Oh yeah, absolutely. At, at, when I was a kid, I would just, I would 
do anything to make money practically. I mean, I would sell Christmas cards to my mother's nine sisters. I would, <laughs> I would go on races in the park in the summertime that you could get paid reward by getting, you know, a few dollars for every race or whatever it is. I would just, you know, do just about anything. And when I was in the fifth grade, I was the publisher of the fifth grade newspaper. And um, I, I had to, we had to write it, produce it and sell it to our classmates and collect the money so that we would have the money for the class trip at the end of the year. So, I mean, you know, I, I just thought it was fun. And I really had to make my own money. I mean, that, that, that it was another thing my parents wanted us to do is, re, you know, learn how to make money what it was worth. And believe it or not, we had bank accounts. And when we were kids, we would take our money that we had made or saved for busy, you know, babysitting or whatever, take it to the bank, put it in our bank book until we had enough money to, if we wanted to get something or buy something, we had the money in our bank book to do it go to the bank and get the money. And I mean, I, it sounds so s simplistic, but actually if more parents did something like that today, maybe more modern, you know, in a way of using the internet uh, banking system or whatever, um, I think kids would be a lot better off. Yeah, I agree. I actually do that with my kids. I give them a budget, but I was exactly the same as you. I loved earning money as a, and um, really just, was driven to see my the rewards the fruits of my rewards you know um well it's a good thing to learn as a as a child you know, the value of it the value of doing the work the value of you know the rewards of the work i um, mean it's i thought it, yeah it was, a, it was a, almost like a game you know that you but it, it was it was fun i enjoyed it well and you know one of the things that struck me as i was researching i you know it sounds like you had a path to become uh, a doctor and you were passionate about um, becoming a medical doctor and at one point you made a pivot once you sat in on a presentation around satellites at the london school of economics so that struck me as one of your pivotal key moments that really set set you on a different path do you want to do you agree, A, and would you share your perspective on that? Sure. Um, I, I talk about it often, about the serendipitous moments in life. Um, and this is certainly one for me, and I've thought many, many times, if I never had that experience, I never would have done what I did uh, in the media. And that was uh, between my junior and senior year in college. I went off to Europe, backpack, you know, $5 a day kind of thing. Uh, as a student, uh, getting, you know, sort of just traveling through. And I was in London and I had I was walking along and I saw this poster for uh, a, a discussion on geosynchronous orbiting satellites. And I thought to myself, well, that is really interesting. I mean, I've got to go and find out about this. Um, I was always, I was, I was a kid at the time of Sputnik and the Russians going into space and the American race to catch up and all of these sorts of things that, you know, the space sort of intrigued me. Um, and I thought, well, that could be really interesting. So I go and listen to this lecture. And it was this idea of geosynchronous orbiting satellites at 22,300 miles above the Earth, which you only needed three of them to cover the Earth. And before that time, there were all these low altitude satellites. You're going to have to have many of them circling around the Earth. and and um, there were a lot of interruptions in, in the coverage and stuff like that. So this was a real breakthrough. And I, I just listened to the story and thinking to myself, well, wow, that is really, really something compelling. And the person giving the lecture, of course, was uh, Arthur C. Clarke, the great science fiction writer who was also a scientist. And he, he actually wrote about geosynchronous orbiting satellites coming out of the Second World War but they had just launched them 20 years later uh, in, in the 60s. And, and this was something very new. And I walked out of that lecture and I thought, wow, that's really powerful. And ever since that time, it was an idea that would never let me go. And, and I think because I had worked in television um, at the educational station in Madison, Wisconsin, where I went to school at the University of Wisconsin. And I had worked at a TV station 
um, in Milwaukee, WTMJ, the NB, uh, NBC station, I, I connected it immediately to television. Um, and I thought to myself, you know, this, this could really be a breakthrough in communications. And then I went on to write my master's thesis on the subject of satellites and communications and how that would change the world of, of communications. And this was time of the Cold War, and we really did not know what was behind the Berlin Wall or the Great Wall of China. Um, today, there is no Berlin Wall, and uh, the Great Wall of China is to bring people in, not to keep them out. Everything is different and has been different uh, for a couple decades now, but then it was still shutting people out and keeping people in. Um, and um, I thought, wow, this, this, this could be a tremendous way for people to connect with people because my belief was people really weren't that different. The political systems were different. And it was a big time of communism against democracy. And there were probably only 60 or less fewer countries that were democracies back then, um, you know, probably a, a third <laughs> or a little bit less than that, but uh, of, of the uh, countries that are democracies today, or at least democracy light, if not true democracies today. And uh, so, I mean, it was really a different period of time. Anyway, I, I went to work for the Communications Satellite Corporation. I was just so enamored of this whole concept of satellites and what they could do. And I, I learned a lot there about, you know, satellites and, um, you know, how, it would, how they would work and how they would interconnect uh, around the globe. And, uh, and then I went to work in cable television um, and in franchising for cable systems uh, in the early 70s. And really saw that that was a that was sort of a backwater industry. I mean, people were it's very small or the cable systems were kind of more rural or outside the urban areas. And they were never really going to grow uh, if they didn't have a way to connect efficiently. And landlines was not affordable by this small group of cable system owners uh, until the night they changed the course of television history which was September 30th, 1975. And that was the night of the thriller from Manila, Muhammad Ali versus Joe Fraser in what is still rated the best heavyweight boxing match of all time. Um, and we brought that signal. I, I was so uh, working with uh, HBO was a client of mine back then. And they had, they had been sending tapes around uh, to send movies and so forth, but they didn't really have an adequate way to send any kind of, and it was also a very small company at that time too. They didn't have an adequate way to do live sports efficiently at all. So <clears throat> they just had um, a little bit of sporting events that were, so they wanted to make a breakthrough. And, you know, it was, a, it was kind of a marriage uh, made in heaven to get them as a client when they were just going into trying to get satellites in the industry. And, um, Anyway, we had brought the event live from Manila to Vero Beach, Florida, demonstrated it for the industry. It was a fantastic night. It was such an amazing boxing match. You could not have picked a better event. If you had your wish book out, you could not have picked a better event. People were so impressed with the, how these satellites could, you know, bring the signal around the earth, how it would come in so clearly. You know, it was just, that was really a breakthrough. And Bob Rosencrantz, who I worked for in the cable industry previously, it was his system. And he said to me, Kay, tonight your dream comes true. And it did. I mean, it gives me chicken skin, really. Like, I get goosebumps. Because if you think about it, before that, all the content was sent, sent around by tape. Yeah. I mean, it's like revolutionized everything from culture to entertainment to connection, human connection, right? I mean, we don't know the impact of what wars were stopped and what connection started, what marriages happened, what transitioned in terms of like massive impact here. This is like a huge moment. Oh, it, 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 it was. And it, it, literally was the night that changed the course of television history. 
And it, of course, it's all changed around the globe today. And now we're in another revolution of streaming and broadband and connecting billions of people around the world. And we're just learning what that means to all of us. Uh, but I have to say, um, I'm not a, I don't look back that much and, you know, I, I have a thousand stories uh, and it's fun to tell the stories, but sometimes when I travel around the world and I, I'm flying into Morocco or I'm flying into New Zealand or flying to some place and you're coming in and you're landing and you just look at all those small satellite dishes on apartment buildings and, you know, on people's homes and stuff. And I just sometimes say to myself, I had a little something to do with that, you know? <laughs> and you know, when, back, back when it was 1975, the satellite dishes were 10 meters. You know, there was no such thing as a satellite dish for the home. Uh, they were 10 meters uh, uh, in, you know, diameter and they they were just huge and they had they had to be installed and they were expensive and they had to be installed and in, mostly in the parking lots of cable systems uh, or in other at that time some you know government installations uh, and so forth but it was really uh, it was kind of the wild west and a lot of fun you know to, to you know, be a part of that and how from that that moment to exiting the company at 4.5 billion how much time was it and was it the 20 was that 21 year period and and would you hindsight go back to who you were at that moment that 1975 september 30th evening and coach yourself to think differently about what a big giant phase you were about to launch yourself into yeah the thing that um the initial capital um, that was supplied by UA Columbia Cablevision, Bob Rosencrantz's company, it was $600,000 to start the company. And it was paid back in the first year. And, um, you know, it really, it wasn't, it, it, it was actually sold for the first time five years later to Time Inc. Paramount and Universal, um, which was, you know, a minor uh, event in, you know, the course of history probably, but it, it really, um, it, there were three companies that were con consistently at odds with one another, even though they were partners in some ways, they were also enemies <laughs> or competitors and others. So they were frenemies, I guess you'd call them, you know, and it, it was uh, a different world to have three big corporate partners like that um, who didn't, they didn't really have a vision for what we were doing. They just sort of felt like, uh, well, this might be something someday, you know, kind of thing. I think time, the Time Inc. people that were uh, owning HBO at that time had a more uh, focused uh, development. I think the studios were just thinking, well, they, you know, they could eventually run some of their program series on the network or something like that when they were finished with syndication. It was, uh, it was you know, fortunately, none of them owned a majority stake, and so you know, I could just go ahead and develop the things that I really wanted to develop for the company, except in, in the sports arena, which we had all the, I really did bring all the professional sports to cable before ESPN. Um, they didn't want to stay with sports and they were so, it was just incredible to me. I mean, I fought with them for a year to say, well, we can have a sports network and an entertainment network. And, you know, we would, make all these arguments. They just didn't have a conviction of what it really could be uh, in terms of real size. And um, at that time, uh, in the early 80s, uh, the, uh, still the networks, like cable networks, were, you know, minor business for most people. And, and certainly the broadcast networks thought it was, uh, it's just, they're just from, just going to be on the margins out there. It was like when Ted Turner launched CNN, he was reviled for, for and laughed at and was a joke to a lot of people in the news business. So this, you know, this mouth from the South in Atlanta is going to build a, yeah, sure, he's going to build a news organization and stuff like that. I mean, we were, you know, we were, in a way, we were, sometimes it was fortunate because uh, actually we could develop 
and grow under the radar screen to some degree because they didn't take it seriously. And then uh, it actually, the business model that we create, I created at our company, um, reversing the licensing um, model, broadcasters paid their local television stations for to carry their signal. And we couldn't do that when we started up in cable because there were so few homes, we would not get enough advertising revenue. So I had to switch the model and have the cable operator pay us. And that's the model that really made all the cable systems, uh, cable networks, I should say, so profitable and much more profitable than the broadcasters. Uh, and for many years later, um, you know, they were much, much more profitable than the television networks were. I don't want to get too much into the detail of it. The television networks eventually started charging money for their signal. But it was a long time after uh, we started, we created that model um, in, in cable. And, uh, you know, so it really created a whole new industry. So it's fun not only creating a company, a network, but it was really, uh, you know, also creating an industry and bigger than any one of us, you know. And, and I think every sporting fan can thank you for being the person, the visionary who said, people want to see sports every night. Why do they have to wait till Saturday and Sunday? I don't get it. Of course, now they want to see it every hour, every, <laughs> you know, so it's even bigger. But yeah, no, absolutely. I, I really did see uh, that we had, uh, we, there were plenty of sporting events, uh, you know, brought in Major League Baseball, the NBA, the NHL, um, you know, the first one to take sort of like the Masters uh, golf event out of Atlanta, um, out of Augusta, I should say, in, into the homes during the week, uh, the U.S. Open tennis tournaments, I mean, all kinds of things, track and field, lots of different sports, um, you know, they're available and no one was covering them and we only had weekend sports and Monday night football at that time. That was really basically it. So you now it, 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 it didn't take a lot of research to understand that the most popular things are movies and sports. You didn't have to do a lot of research to figure that out. Right. And today, today the sports market is humongous and it's more uh, in real time. People want to see events in real time and they're, real gathering places, people gather together to see big sporting events uh, yeah. and in real time as they will, you know, for the Super Bowl, for example, um, and, or for really any sport and the team sports and uh, your college teams, your professional teams, all this sort of stuff is everybody wants to see them in real time today. So uh, it's, it's more necessary. Everything else that we watch today, we can record or we can stream or we can do you know we can watch it in our time uh so it's it's really fascinating how things have changed technology changes the business plan and business opportunities and you know the names of people that you are in the boardroom with the barry dillers the ted turners the uh michael eisner's the larry ellison's you know, were there, was there ever a point in time, Kay, that you looked around the room and thought, I'm the only woman in this room and it's multiple times over? Or did you have other women in the room with you at times that you could share? Or was that not on your radar at that time? Well, in the entire time that I ran USA Network, they were all men. In fact, as Tracy, I would say that I've had every man in Hollywood, except Bob Daly, on my board. <laughs> so, you know, I, I, you know, there weren't any other women. Um, and uh, I remember the first time after the three companies uh, bought USA Network, we had our first board meeting at Paramount Studios in Los Angeles, and. I have to say it was sort of like feeling like Dorothy from Kansas. You know, it was really uh, interesting, not intimidating, but sort of like, okay, there are 15 men in this room, all these CEOs, presidents of these various companies, media companies, and this little company called USA Network. Uh, and 
it gets kind of heavy at the top, if you know what I mean. <laughs> and they would, you know, get into arguments with one another about other things they were doing that didn't have anything to do with. I mean, it was a really, it was where I really, really saw boys behaving badly, <laughs> you know. And I, I, I say that, you know, with a, sort of a twinkle in my eye, I, I mean, I just realized that they, they belonged to, the, this was their club. And, uh, you know, I, they respected me. I, you know, I did what I did and succeeded at what I did uh, while they were in the ownership. But they, um, you know, they were, they were not visionaries about the business at all. Um, it was really having to push, push it all, all the way. And uh, I think that uh, it, there were just no other women. Um, Sherry Lansing was at a studio at that point in time and running a studio, but you know, she didn't have anything to do with what we were doing at USA. And, and uh, uh, Lucy Salhaney was running Paramount and then the initial lift of the, the Fox network. Um, and, you know, been a lifelong friend of, of mine. Mm. Uh, so we, man, I, there were other women around, but not, not in the boardrooms where I was. And was there a time that, because you were the tiny, maybe the tinier or smaller business in the room, but you outperformed Ted Turner's station, I think 13 seasons in a row. At least that, <laughs> Ted, Ted is such a competitor. I mean, we're friends, uh, but he, uh, you know, he was a real competitor and he couldn't stand it uh, when, see, he, he started off with WTBS the television station and uh, sort of got around the rules of, of being able to carry uh, the Atlanta Braves when he had uh, the local uh, contract for them out into uh, the country, uh, across the country. And I was paying Major League Baseball to bring the, the games in. And it really sort of burned me that I had to pay a pretty high fee for the games. And he was just, you know, lifting them off uh, out of his local market. But that was in the sports. When we went into uh, entertainment programming, uh, starting in sort of a, the middle eighties, uh, you know, it didn't take us long to supersede what he was doing and to really capture first place uh, in the ratings. And I loved it because Ted hated it. <laughs> it's just a little competition in me, I guess, <laughs> you know, but it was really gratifying. And so in your personal life at that point, were you married? Were you thinking about children? Where was, where were you, or how did you balance the impact of that at that time? Yes, I, I, I was married though early in the seventies um, uh, to my husband, my first husband, who is still my first husband. Uh, <laughs> he, uh, we've been around together for a long time. Um, he, uh, Bill was a communications lawyer. And so we actually went in the cable business together. We Amazing. actually came company and did the same thing uh, at the company that was, we went out and won franchises. And I really, I, it was a couple years of doing that. And it's what Bill really wanted to do. I was doing it and I learned about the cable industry, but I wanted to say, I wanted to do this program thing. And I had to really wait for the industry to catch up. Uh, in order, and that was in the early 70s. I was 73, 74, then 75 came along, uh, the Thriller from Manila. That's when we decided to launch USA to put it together. Uh, it actually got technically launched in uh, 1977, but it was announced in 1976. So 77 to 98 was really the period of time that, that I did that. And, um, yeah, it was great. I, I love the media business. I really absolutely love it. Um, it, it does change over time, so it keeps you on your toes. Uh, but when I left, I really, I kind of, I'm a, I needed something new um, to challenge me, something different to challenge me. And that's where I kind of ran into the idea of, well, all of this money, there wasn't any money to do in the market. People didn't believe when I started USA uh, or later on when, you know, Turner came along with CNN or when MTV got launched around 1980, about that time, um, you know, people didn't want to put any money in it. They thought it was a, a folly and they think it'd be anything. And, and, and there wasn't a, only uh, Mike Milken was the only guy around, which in junk bonds, uh, 
really saved the industry, the industry that built the cable systems. Uh, he probably financed the majority of the cable system operators in the country and Ted Turner. Um, so, you know, it, it, there really wasn't capital around. And when I left you, I was leaving USA, uh, I had already been asked by President Clinton to uh, be the chair of the National Women's Business Council. And uh, I said to him, and that was really to report to Congress about the advancement of women-owned businesses, uh, but didn't really float my boat. I mean, I really like to get results and that wouldn't produce any result. I mean, yeah. you know, reporting. What are you doing? Just reporting, um, which is okay. But it would, you know, I said to him, if I could get women into private capital, equity capital, now that would change something in the marketplace. I'd like to do that. And he said, okay, you, you know, as long as you report to Congress, uh, you can do, you can use the platform to do that. That'd be great. So we actually used the platform. We didn't actually charge anything to, you know. Congress or anything to do any of this, uh, but I use the public platform uh, to really go out and investigate venture capital, which I really didn't know very much about. Mm -hmm. You know, the thing that I think was so impactful was when you really saw the vision for Springboard was when you realized how little capital was being deployed to women-owned business. Yeah, so about the time that I was uh, going to leave USA, I actually accepted the position of uh, the chair of the National Women's Business Council. Com gave me a, a platform to work with to go out and explore how to get women into more equity capital. Women were not getting any of the equity capital from venture capital uh, to speak of at that time. And uh, it was really, truly what I found out was it wasn't a rejection of women. It was really, there was no connection. Uh, people in venture capital were bunch of guys from the chip industry, um, you know, uh, literally, and they had been at it for maybe 20 years at that time, uh, but they didn't really know any women in business that were going to build the type of high growth businesses that they wanted to fund. They just figured women don't do that. They just like small business. And, you know, anyone that knows me does not ever put small and women business in the same sentence because I don't accept that. Uh, but and so I went out to, uh, I happened to be on the board of Oracle back then, and I know a few people in the business uh, of venture capital. And I went out and, you know, started asking people about it and got some advice from people. But I, we, we decided there were about, at that point in time, probably six of us uh, that were talking to each other about what, what to do and how to, you know, approach the market. And then we realized that the only way that would be productive was to go out and find women business uh, founders who were in technology or life science, the industries that were being funded then, and see if they were fundable. I, so we you know, put out a call uh, in the fall of 99 uh, to see how many we could find, and we were hoping to find maybe 100. Well, a deadline came and we had 350 applications that I went like, holy cow, this is really interesting. I wonder how many are really good or how many are really fundable. And, um, you know, we actually called it down to 26 companies uh, at that point in time. And we brought them for, through boot camp and we were literally writing the boot camp a week before we were teaching it. I mean, it was really that kind of experience. Fortunately, we had people that had experience in um, venture that were working with us. And, and um, so in January of 2000, we had our first demo day uh, at the Oracle Conference Center. I really, really, being from the media, I was really concerned about women being on a big stage, big graphics, big projected screens. And, you know, I didn't want them to be in the basement of a community center or something or even a university. Uh, I really, they had to be on par uh, with other presentations. And uh, it was an exciting day. It was like showtime. And uh, the amazing thing was 22 of the 26 got funded. And uh, two others merged the business because they were in the same SaaS business, literally. One woman sold her business uh, for $100 million that year. And uh, another woman wasn't funded. 
And that's really what we've been doing ever since that time in Springboard. That was the uh, launch of Springboard Enterprises uh, non, as a nonprofit. Uh, why a nonprofit? Back in those days, uh, there were just people did not believe women were going to, you know, launch big sustainable businesses of this sort. Um, and, you know, so there wasn't a lot of capital around. We had to really hunt for it and, and really try to introduce people into capital sources. But uh, raising a fund of, of size to put, like, say, a tech stores model or something like that today, which is very common. Um, there were many models like that, <clears throat> whether it's 500 startups or whether it's angel list, there's many now, but they didn't exist then. Um, and certainly didn't exist for women. And so it, it launched as a nonprofit. It has been a nonprofit for, for 20 years. But it really, really is extraordinary for human capital. And what I realized in that very first year was that it was much more about the ecosystem, that you couldn't just go out and look for capital, that you really had to understand all those forces that help people grow companies to size. And that is investors, yes, but attorneys, accountants, business, business associates, um, you know, people who could connect you, experts in different categories. And even in that first year, uh, a third of the companies were in life science and biotech devices, diagnostics. Um, and today we add healthcare IT, which is a very you know, big category now, and especially during COVID. Um, it has really flourished. It's been around for a long time, but it's really flourished now. And um, and two-thirds have been in technologies, uh, all different kinds of technologies. Today, a lot of them involve artificial intelligence, blockchain, machine learning, um, you know, all kinds of things, AI and VI, AR and VR, all kinds of things like that that are in different industries. And you know, so we've seen this all mature over time. And it's really been exhilarating. I have to say it's been exhilarating to see a lot of women step up to the plate and really, you know, really uh, put not only their whole effort into it, but have learned uh, what it's like to raise equity capital and what it means. There was a lot of fear, of, still is some, but there was a lot of fear about it back in 2000, in the early days, women just were petrified that other people would get money, but they would get equity in their company, and um, they were fearful of what would happen to them when they did that. I think today women really understand what it means, and they understand how to proceed under those, um, you know, conditions today. And they've looked, so it's, a, I think, quite a different market that we're looking at today. And how much um, how much capital have you deployed into women companies since founding Springboard? And what's the total market value of the business businesses that you've invested in? Well, Springboard is is a nonprofit, so it doesn't have an investment arm. Uh, that mm -hmm. may change relatively soon. But Springboard Growth Capital is really not a part of Springboard. Um, it does it, we do. I am a partner uh, in, in that firm, and we are in growth capital. So we're not early stage, we're not seed stage, not series A stage, not some B, but uh, you know, mostly C, series C and beyond, because that's the stage that is considered the real growth stage. And it's a little later in the development. You have a lot to look at in terms of, and, and we do concentrate on women-led uh, companies. Uh, mm -hmm. They happen to be in that group uh, uh, the, directed at the digital consumer. So it could be, you know, a, dig, uh, a consumer product, a consumer service, a technology that is, uh, you know, the backbone of a consumer service, uh, a digital health, uh, you know, it could be a span of things, but it is the digital consumer in mind. Um, and Springboard Enterprises has whole categories of biotech and devices and diagnostics and things like that. Now, to give you a, an idea about the 819 companies that have come through Springboard Enterprises so far, um, 
88% of them have raised capital. 75% um, of them are operating today, which is an amazing number. Um, over $13 billion has been raised by the companies. The value created is over $27.2 billion of value created by the companies with uh, over 200, actually 216 exits as of today and uh, 21 IPOs. And there are a lot of companies in that springboard enterprises nonprofit group that are valued over a billion dollars today as a private company. So unbelievable. Uh, so if anyone asks me, can women build scalable and sustainable businesses? All you have to do is look at the enterprise, you know, the enter springboard enterprises portfolio of companies that have come through our programs and with whom we still work all the way through to liquidity events. So we stay with them. We're not just an accelerated goodbye and good luck. We're lifelong with them and many are serial entrepreneurs, uh, many who have exited start other companies. Uh, Helen Greiner would be a, a, a prime example. She was uh, one of the, she was a co-founder of iRobot. She's always been in robotics. Um, she has female partners and um, she uh, uh, you know, was the CEO when they took it public um, and uh, she stayed there for a number of years. She wanted to get into drones uh, which are also flying robots, if you will, uh, similar. That was her dream. She did that. She started a company called um, Sci-Fi Works, interestingly enough. And um, and when she left that company, she went in to be a um, consultant for the Army and robotics. And today she's got another company that she is the CEO of. And it is back in robotics. It's a robotic, a term, a, a robotic machine, sort of like the... Roomba and the Scuba and other products that were developed by iRobot, but this one weeds your garden for you. <laughs> so for all those people that have gardens, they'd say, oh great, I can just you know sit back and enjoy my little robot weeding my garden for me and trimming it. You know, it looks so beautiful. And so she's, you know, she's loved robotics. But anyway, she's done a number of companies. She's just one of many, many examples of uh, serial entrepreneurs. I love that. Um, Kay, I think if anyone wants to learn more about you, I, I would highly recommend reading one of your two books that you've written. One is, and it's so well titled, Been There, Run That. And the other one is Bold Women, Big Ideas. Bold Women, Big Ideas was really written right after we launched Springboard because I wanted the, the tech market collapsed 60 days after we did our first demo day. And I, I really didn't want women to get pushed out. I really was concerned about, you know, last in, first out, you know, people wouldn't come in to fund. So I wrote that book to inspire women uh, to really stay the course. Uh, there, Here we are. We got your back. We're going to be okay. Let's go forward. Um, and the other one in there, Run That is a book that really is a compilation of a lot of blogs that are written by the entrepreneurs. Um, and there are visceral lessons from on the ground. Yeah. And that, I think that's really important, Tracy, to, uh, to other entrepreneurs. They really love the advice of other peers of theirs who are going through the same thing. They love the expert advice, but they also love to learn from one another. And uh, I'm just now looking at uh, perhaps doing another uh, another version because we have a lot of content that we can, you know, and as things develop and move forward, you know, some of the solutions that you have change and some of the challenge that you have change. So, and I think, I think even in your own career, hearing about how you had to take, let's say, lemons and make them into lemonade or how you had to pivot or how you had to reinvent yourself. There were multiple times where I think you would yourself say, I could have been three decisions away from r running the train off the track, right? I love the David Stern. I just, I didn't know your husband was in your in the room with you, but I love the the David Stern run down the hall and crap, I just 
sold David's, you know, I did this deal at David's turn and now I have to pivot because, you know, I have to figure out a deal here because, right? And I think that that's the, the case, but over and over again, Kay, what strikes me about you so much is that your mindset and your tenacity and your grit and your willingness to see the optimism or the opportunity is really the pivot moment. Well, yeah, I've always, look, there were a lot of barriers, a lot of uh, women perhaps that would be listening to this podcast or people that would be listening to it may not realize in the period of time uh, when I started in business, it was highly unusual for a woman to do anything like that. Um, and there were a lot of barriers that don't exist today even. Um, they, you know, women weren't able to go to golf clubs where a lot of businesses, you know, where people were doing their business with one another. Um, there were a lot of eating clubs, men's eating clubs. Uh, take Augusta National, for example, uh, in the first year where we televised, 1982, there were, um, you know, I, I was running USA, I negotiated the deal. I went there for the luncheon uh, on uh, media day. There were about 14 of us. I was the only woman, of course. And uh, we were standing up in front of the clubhouse, uh, ready to go into lunch. And Horde Harden, who was the chairman of Augusta back then, uh, it, I was talking to him. And he said, oh, time to go to lunch. Let's go to lunch. So we all followed him. And I was he was heading up the stairs. He went into the golf club. He's going up the stairs uh, and he gets to the top of the stairs and turns around and looks at me and he says, uh, okay, he said, well, hey, we don't allow women on the second floor. I said, oh, oh, Lord, what are we going to do about it? I mean, I wasn't going to go downstairs and eat lunch by myself. I mean, that was ridiculous. It wasn't my problem. It was his problem, you know, and, and he... To his credit, he quickly said, oh, I think we'll go down to the trophy room and eat, where we ate for the next 10 years until they opened the uh, upstairs dining room for men uh, to everybody. And it was a really kind of bland, not very interesting room once you got up there. But <clears throat> there is a sign when you, at the bottom of the stairs, before you start to go up the stairs, there's a sign that says, no women allowed on the second floor dining. And I just walked right by it because I figured he was taking me up there. He must have made an exception for me. Well, not quite, <laughs> you know, um, but there were a lot. I had a lot of incidences like that um, that were, you know, people would take me to an eating club that women weren't allowed to go to. And then they say, oh, women aren't allowed in our club. They, you get to the front door and they turn around and look at me like, well, sorry, but women aren't allowed in my eating club. You know, uh, well, OK, well, then where are we going to eat? You know, because, it, it, but women were, were excluded. Um, today it's, look, there are social, there are social networks today that women don't have that uh, much access to either. Uh, but it's not embedded in the culture the way it was back then. It was it's, a period of time. I mean, it's so remarkable. I just, it blows me away. And it's so, it, it, you're right. The thing is, is we all, at this point are standing on the shoulders of women like you who have forged this path that have allowed us to even have the conversation that's to sit in the room, right? Well, well, thank you. I mean, it's a generous comment. I think there were many of us that had to sort of break barriers um, in, in business. Uh, I'll, many people before us uh, that had to do it. Um, so I, I benefited from others who were there maybe they were doing it differently maybe they were struggling for women's vote maybe they were struggling for you know other things uh in our culture to change for women um and you know i i had the benefit of at least having them out in front of me uh, which was really you know fantastic as well for me but i never doubted i never doubted that i could do what i wanted to do um i've made a lot of mistakes in my life <laughs> Uh, you know, I've made wrong decisions and not done, I maybe should have done this and I didn't do it. And, you know, I mean, those sorts of things. But but when I was doing something, I, I never doubted that I could do it because 
growing up as a kid, I was, I was kind of always the leader in my class and things that I was doing. And I just figured I'm a leader, you know, <laughs> that's who I am. And, and it sounds sort of, I don't know, crazy to say that, but it reinforces itself. Every time you do something and you're successful at it, it reinforces itself. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I mean, you're successful at what you do and, you know, you had to fight your way through and, you know, each success that you did, you got, you got stronger and stronger in it, you know, and that, that's, that's now today with all the social media and everything that is out there to communicate with people, we just have to continue to highlight and bring to the foreground people, women, who are doing extraordinary things. I keep telling those stories because people will believe them when they see them. I think that, you know, the women, black women and women of color uh, have the same and more uh, difficult challenge today uh, than we have uh, because they, they're back where we were 20 years ago. They don't have a system. They don't have the mentors, they don't, it, 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 they don't have access to capital, but they don't have access to what they really need before capital. And that's what has to be built out for them because creating wealth is what's going to change um, the prospects for, you know, people of color of all sorts, all people of color. Without a question. I think you probably read this last week, Roz Brewer's um, been named as the CEO of the Walgreens Boots globally. I mean, what an amazing. She has an amazing story because I first met her when she was running Sam's Club for yep. the Waltons. And, uh, you know, she really has had a great trajectory on her career. And I'm sure she will do very well um, at Walgreens because uh, she's had great, great training um, and opportunities. Uh, and that's what someone can do when they're given the challenge, they pick up the challenge, and then they make opportunities for themselves. So I, I was thrilled to see it. I really was. Yeah. yeah, and opportunities for the next gen of woman who's making her way through her career and trying to figure it out. Um, one of the things, Kay, I want to read you in closing today is one of my favorite quotes of yours. And I want to remind you of something uh, that you said, because I think this is a, such a perfect encapsulation of your personality. You said, I see nothing but infinite possibilities when I look out at the world. I do. There's so many possible, there are a lot of problems to solve and there are a lot of possibilities to do that. And there are a lot of possibilities to think about what doesn't exist and what could be. Um, you know, maybe it's a little bit of my uh, fascination with science fiction. Science fiction, uh, you know, is always sort of out there um, on the edge of uh, humanity oftentimes. But it oftentimes what is envisioned in science fiction actually does come true. And it's imagination and the ability to execute. And I, I, I just think there are infinite opportunities out there. And I, I hope that women feel emboldened uh, to uh, make their way through uh, the challenges of building those amazing, amazing businesses, or even if it's not building a business for a career that they really want to have, because that sort of passion to drive you is whether it's a career or in a corporation, whether it's a artistic career, whether it's a teaching career, whatever it is, um, you know, it's so much more fulfilling in life if you're doing something that really captures your own imagination. Kay, I just want to thank you so much for sharing your tenacity, your passion, your foresight, your vision, and allowing us to have insight into how you built your your career path and your success but also just how you continue to give back and inspire women to continue forward on our own paths and trajectory it, it's sort of funny because i spent the first 
part of my career with all the men. <laughs> and then I said, well, where are the women? They aren't here. We got to get them in here. And, you know, the second half has been, you know, spending with the women. It's, and it's different. It's, it's different. It's, it's operating in the two worlds is quite different. By the way, you know, Christy's not our only mutual friend because, as you know, uh, Tina Clark and, and Michelle uh, LeClaire are, are very, very, very dear friends. Oh, we have so many friends in common and uh, so many of the companies you've invested in or that you've led um, through Hint, you know, Hint and Aquas and many of the Springboard um, Boot Camp um, uh, graduates, I would say, uh, you know, um, and that's really the purpose of this podcast, Kay, is really in an effort to share and collaborate and, and open up the communication amongst women who have been at these various stages and share our success and our sage wisdom. And also just like, hey, here's where we screwed this up. And if I had had someone like me to call, I would have been able to probably. Yeah, yeah that's really important to have these networks of people. And that's really the secret sauce of Springboard Enterprises. It's really the human capital. Thank you for tuning in to From Potential to Powerhouse, Success Secrets from Female Leaders with your host, Tracy Holland.